If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today. Well, we're continuing in a series we began last time on comparative religions. This is show number two in that uh, mini series, you might say. I'm not really planning to do any more after this, but down the line, you never know, I might add to it. But for now, uh, we're just going to conclude this, this little mini series as a highlight form for people, brothers and sisters in the Lord, that want to have just kind of a little taste of what these other religions out there, cults and sects, believe, uh, not in great detail, but just enough to have a good understanding of what they, what they believe to where they as Christians can witness to them uh, with the biblical truth, having an understanding of where these people are coming from as far as their own particular theological proclivities may, may lie. So uh, with that said, I want to thank... Uh, very special guest for joining me today, Bob L. Ross. Bob, it's great to have you here Thank once you again, brother. Uh, Bob is director of Pilgrim Publications out of Pasadena, Texas. He is one of the world's leading publishers of the works of the Prince of Preachers of the 19th century, the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Uh, and I'm going to let Bob talk a little bit about that. Bob has also written many books on different subjects, and he's a public speaker, and he's been in many uh, public debates as well. But Bob, tell our viewing audience a little bit about C.H. Spurgeon, just in case they're not familiar with this man. Well, Larry, I have a bookstore in Pasadena, Texas, and in that store we have a special section. You saw it the other day when you were there, devoted to Spurgeon's books, which we publish. And the question I most often get in that bookstore is, who was C.H. Spurgeon? And did, just this past week, a young man who's a, licensed Baptist preacher said to me, said, who's Spurgeon? I said, uh, you never heard of Spurgeon and you're a young Baptist preacher, licensed to preach? No, I never heard of Spurgeon. I said, well, you'll never make it through the Baptist ministry not knowing about Spurgeon, so let me give you some literature. So I gave him some free literature and we have this little folder, who was C.A. Spurgeon? But here's another source of information about Spurgeon. I'll tell about it and then we'll go on to our regular study. This is a pictorial biography of Spurgeon. I put this together years ago utilizing scores of pictures. Now, if you love pictures, you really love this. It tells the story of Spurgeon's life in pictures. The reading material, uh, you could probably read that in about 30 minutes. Uh, the reading material is very slack, but uh, th there's a lot of pictures in here that tells about Spurgeon and his lifetime. And so uh, this is a book that we've sold many, many copies of. Many people have learned about Spurgeon through this book. So I'd recommend it to those today that don't know about Spurgeon and want to learn more about him. And he was considered the prince of preachers. Right. More books, more publishers have something today by Spurgeon than any author, living or dead. Now, when he was alive, didn't uh, newspapers in various places publish some of his sermons from uh, week no, to week? In those days, you know, the communication was different, but by cable, they sent Spurgeon's sermons to the United States. 
and they published them even in the United States newspapers, so his, getting them from England by the transatlantic cable. And he, and he was preaching back in the 1880s, 1890s, stuff like that. Right. Before the uh, speakers uh, were invented, the speaking systems were created, uh, before uh, television, of course, before radio and before tape recordings, and uh, before any of these means, he was uh, nevertheless capable of publishing his sermons by weekly booklets and getting them sent out all over the world. Sort of like the thousands of people. In, yes, in a way, an 18th or 19th century Billy Graham, in a sense, through the way his uh, evangelical message was communicated around the world. If Spurgeon had been living today with all the communications we have, he would be. Uh, well, if you went by the ratio of popularity, he would be the most popular preacher in the world for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that should give people a perspective of who the C.H. Version was way back in time. Right. But now, let's get us back to our main time. One, one thing I should say, uh, anyone that needs free information or literature about Pilgrim Publications or from our ministry, Christian Answers, feel free to contact us, and uh, we will be more than happy to send you free literature and information uh, we have a wide variety of uh, books and tapes. Also, we have two websites that you uh, may be interested in checking out, so please contact us. We'll be more than happy to help. Okay, with that said, we've been covering uh, the contrast of Christianity, historic Christianity, biblical Christianity, with all these other world religions, cults, sects, and so forth, uh, to help our brothers and sisters in Christ have a better understanding of what they're dealing with when they run into people of different religious persuasions, so they might share the gospel with them in a more effective way. And for our other viewers who may not be Christians, but may be in one of these other religions, so they can understand where we're coming from and have a better understanding of what biblical Christianity is. So it it's kind of serves two purposes at the same time. Now, we're going to pick up where we left off from last time, and we're going to come to a, a major point. And Bob was about to go off on this point on the last show, but I kind of stopped him before he get into it, but I'm not going to stop him this time. And first I'll give you a review of all these religions in contrast to historic Christianity, and then we're going to have Bob, Brother Bob's comments on this at the end, and we'll have a little discussion and move on to our next point of topic here in, in this comparative religion analysis. Okay, if you'll see on your screen, you can see what we have here is the person of Jesus Christ, and under historic Christianity, basically what this is saying is, who is Jesus Christ? And the uh, answer to that question of who is Jesus Christ, found and given by historic Christianity, is that Jesus Christ is one divine person, eternal, with two natures, human and divine, born on earth as a fully human being, supreme of example of God's character and his love for humanity, full and final revelation of God and his love. Just one example, see John chapter 1 verses 1 through 13. So basically the historic Christianity is saying that Jesus is God and he's fully human at the same time. He's, he's the God man. He's man and God. He's the second person of the Trinity. There's a Father, the Son, who is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And this is what historic, biblical Christianity says about who Jesus Christ is. Now, in contrast to this, we move on to uh, Judaism. And they say, uh, this is what they say about Jesus Christ. They say he's a humble and insignificant prophet, but certainly neither the Messiah nor God. Orthodox Judaism considers him less favorably than Reformed Judaism. In fact, in their, uh, their uh, uh, Jewish Talmud, which is considered their holy writings by a lot of their rabbis and so forth, their esteemed rabbis, uh, it basically says in the Jewish Talmud that Jesus was the bastard son of Mary, a whore, and a Roman soldier. And it goes on to say that Jesus was a false prophet and he's uh, his followers are burning and boiling excrement and all this type of stuff. You find this in the Jewish Talmud, and we've got material to verify that if people don't need in-depth documentation on that. But anyway, uh, that's their concept, basically, through the Talmud of who they say Jesus is, a false prophet. And 
you know, so forth. Anyway, in Islam, they consider Jesus a major prophet. He's the spirit of Allah, or God, without sin, but he is certainly not divine. His miracles are signs that he came from God, but he is in no means, is he God? And of course, in Islam, they say he's not the son of God. So that's what the Muslims think of Jesus. Definitely a contrast with the biblical record. Hinduism, for some Hindus, Jesus was an avatar or incarnation of God, one among many avatars, a great spiritual leader, a guru. Other, uh, other Hindus don't consider him much of anything. Anyway, in Buddhism, he's a teacher who may possess Buddhahood or enlightenment, one among many, but he's definitely not unique. Sikhism says he's not a divine person, they deny he's God, but a man through whom God worked and revealed himself. The Baha'i world faith says he's the son of God, but not divine, he's not God. One of God's manifestations, who also include Krishna, Buddha, Abraham, Moses, Muhammad, and Baha'u'llah, who we mentioned in the previous show. So Jesus is just one among many. Okay, uh, Native American religions, originally no reference to uh, person or work of Jesus Christ. In secular humanism, view Jesus as just another human teacher. They deny that Jesus is divine. New Age Movement says Jesus was one of many appearances of God throughout the ages, one of many people who were fully aware of their own divinity. Of course, they believe that everybody is divine. They take a pantheistic view and, and say, well, you're divine, I'm divine, we're all divine. And even that that tin can on the ground is divine. But anyway, that's New Age movement ideas of deity. Okay, Roman Catholicism says that Jesus is one divine person, eternal, fully human and divine, supreme example of God's character and his love for humanity, full and final revelation of God and his love. John 1, verses 1 through 13. Seventh-day Adventist Church says that he's the, uh, they basically agree with historic Christianity on this point. Jehovah's Witnesses a created being with stages of existence. First, he was the Archangel Michael, or the Word. Second, he became Jesus, perfect man, became Messiah at his baptism. Three, after his spiritual resurrection, became Michael, the Archangel again, but retains, retains the name of Jesus. So basically, Jesus uh, was an angel. God made him into this man, Jesus, who died and, and then was resurrected as uh, an angel again, but he also has the name Jesus now. Okay, the Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, say that Jesus is the spiritual and physical offspring of God by procreation, had a pre-existence as God's spirit child, and is a brother of Lucifer. And so they believe that Jesus is just a spiritual child of uh, procreation between these other gods who, uh, you know, man and a woman, in a previous existence who he was created through them and then one of his brothers was the devil, Lucifer. So interesting concept coming from the Mormons on who Jesus is. Uh, Church of Christ scientists, the uh, Christian scientists, they say that Jesus, uh, who is separate from Christ, is a human being who more than any other human being shows the, quote, Christ ideal. And they don't, they don't believe that Jesus is a Christ, but simply that everybody is the Christ and can realize the Christ, which is their own divine nature. Okay, uh, Unity School of Christianity says that Jesus was a man inhabited by the Christ principal spirit. So once again, they also distinguish Jesus from being the Christ and redefine the term as to who Christ and what Christ is. Okay, the Church of Scientology, founded by L. Ron Hubbard, says that Jesus was a great teacher who fully realized his personal divinity as a clear, according to Scientology terminology. Now, and that would take me a long time to explain all that, so I'll just let it go for now. Unification Church, uh, the Reverend Moon, the, the Korean man who thinks he's the return of Christ, he says that Jesus is a perfect man who was faithful to God and attained deity, not equal to God, but yet he failed when he got crucified, and that's why it takes Reverend Moon, uh, the leader of the Unification Church, to come back and start the perfect spiritual family because Jesus, after all, was supposed to get married and have kids, but he ended up blowing it by getting crucified and wasn't able to do that, so that's why Reverend Moon is, had to come along and do all this stuff. But anyway, 
The uh, Way International says that Jesus is not co-equal with God, did not pre-exist before his earthly life. Uh, he's the son of God, but not God, the son. A perfect man, but he's definitely not divine. So, Bob, you were going to talk about this in the last show, but I kind of cut you off. Now, we can talk about something that Jesus himself asked about in Matthew chapter 16. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, of course, we all know that Peter gave the perfect answer. But remember, right. there was other answers being given about who Jesus was. But Jesus said only one of those answers was the right answer. Right. In the book of Matthew, uh, Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And all of the early apostles that were converted to Christ, you can look in the first chapter of John and see where those early disciples began to one by one come to Christ. They all came to him and acknowledged him to be the Son of God. And even when he was crucified, remember the Roman soldier became the first testimony or the first witness of the uh, fact he was the Son of God when he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. And uh, that has been the message all through the years, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that means, according to even the Jewish people who lived in his day, that he made himself equal with God. That's right. That was the charge against Jesus that he blasphemed. And so you being a man, make yourself equal right, with God. They charged him with blasphemy, and therefore he was worthy of death because he made himself equal with God. And so by his own enemies, they testified that he claimed to be the Son of God. And there are others, of course, that uh, gave testimony to the fact he was the Son of God. And the fact that he was raised from the dead, the Apostle Paul argues, is testimony to the fact that he was the Son of God. That was just part of God's own testimony to him. God bore witness to him at the resurrection. God bore witness to him at his baptism. Uh, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove That's right. out of heaven and saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I well pleased. And then another instance when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with, uh, it's Matthew chapter 17. Right. With uh, There was uh, the Moses. three disciples taken up there, and That's they right. saw Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. Moses. And uh, they saw there the testimony he was the Son of God. So three different times God has miraculously bore witness to the fact he was the Son of God. All the early Christian apostles bore testimony to the fact he was the Son of God. And uh, now, when it comes to these cults and sects and false professing Christian people, you can always put them to the test by the doctrine of the Son of God. Was Jesus the Son of God? And uh, some of them will say, oh yes, he was the Son of God, but that was just by virtue of his being miraculously born of a virgin. He was the Son of God this way. That's not the history, the historic, the orthodox doctrine that Jesus is the Son of God. Son of God means he has all the attributes of God, one of which therefore would be eternity. And as the Son of God, he's the eternal Son. We don't have an eternal Father unless we have an eternal Son. Because you can't have a Father without a Son. Am I right? Is that right. logical? So therefore, Christianity is always taught, and I have these confessions of faith that are here with me today from Baptists, for example. Any one of these would testify that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. Now, the reason I emphasize that, Larry, and I'll not name any names here, but a few years ago, there was some hesitancy and some lack of emphasis upon the Son of God. And so you will recall that we in particular were putting heavy emphasis upon the fact that Jesus was the Son of God eternally and that there were some that were teaching something less than that. Right. And in the providence of God, though, 
uh, that emphasis, whether it was ours or someone else's, has helped to bring some of the brethren back to the history. In fact, you even position. wrote a book on that. What's the title of that book? Yes, I wrote a book called The Trinity and Eternal Sonship of Jesus Christ. We have that available through our ministry and through your bookstore. Right, and uh, that book has uh, had a lot of good response uh, down through the years since we wrote it. And uh, so uh, today, it's almost like we have the enemy backed in the corner now. We've got him under control, so to speak, that Jesus is the Son of God. And they're not out here popping their little cap guns so much about uh, his being the Son of God by incarnation or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's got to be done every once in a while in church history. Mm -hmm. Remember, Athanasius was one of the right. first way back when he took that stand and and more or less was the uh, more the brunt of all the criticism. And, and then, yeah, yep. and then through the years you've had other challenges to the fact that Jesus Christ was uh, possessed of all the attributes of the Father, but it has stood the test, and we believe it'll continue to stand the test down through time that Jesus is indeed the Son of the Living God. Amen. And I like that reference you gave right off the bat, and I looked it up here in uh, John chapter five. I'm reading from a King James Version. But it says in verse 17 and following, it says, But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hither, hitherto, and I work. Verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. And you go down a few verses, and it, said in, it says in verse 18, 23 that all men should honor the son even as they honor the father he that honoreth not the son honoreth not the father with which has sent him and so you have all these references not only here but all over the scripture about jesus being the son of god and if you're going to honor god the father at all you better honor the son in the same manner you honor God the Father. And Larry, I like that scripture you gave us. There's a lot of weight there because, uh, you know, when your enemies will confirm your own testimony, exactly, uh, you really have a point. Well, that's what made it so well, powerful. Well, the Jews of Christ's day confirmed that he said he was the Son of God and made himself equal with God. That's right. Now, they thought that was a strike against him, but actually their testimony because they were the religious scholars. You could not get a higher testimony than those people to the public because they were the ultimate. Now, those people said Jesus claimed that he was the Son of God equal with God. Now, what does that say then for all future generations? We have some people saying, oh, Jesus never claimed he's the Son of God. Well, the Jews said he did, and That's they right. had more knowledge of him than you did because they were standing there listening to him, <laughs> and they charged him with that. That's and, right. Uh, so therefore, these fellows that come along, I heard one one time, he said, oh, well, Jesus never claimed uh, he was the Son of God and all this. Well, how come the Jews understood it that way right. if he didn't? In fact, they understood it so well. You just made me think of this passage here in the Gospel of uh, Mark, chapter 14, starting in verse 61 and following. Once again, reading from a King James Version. But it says here, But he held his peace, that's talking about Jesus, and answered nothing. Again, the high priest, who should know about these things you're talking about in Israel there, asked him, asking Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the Christ? The Son, the Son of the Blessed. And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we of any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned, condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, Prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. So Jesus is condemned to death for claiming to be the son of the blessed. And then what did they say about this? Blasphemy. Because he's claiming to be equal with God himself. Right. And they knew this to be the case, and that's why he was condemned to death. So it goes right back 
to the very point of why was Jesus crucified? Because he claimed to be the Son of God. And so many people don't seem to realize this. They, they want to come up with all these other ideas. But here you have Jesus himself in a kangaroo court of law. You know, that's what it was. It was a court, but they, they were determined to get Jesus. But he told them straight up when they asked him, are you the son of the blessed? Uh -huh. He said, I am. And you will see the son of man coming in the clouds. And he was referencing right back to the book of Daniel, which is talking about the Messiah. Once again, giving another reference that he is that Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the one that's promised to come. I, He's the one those 456 Old Testament prophecies are talking about. I and like, they knew it. Go ahead. Yeah, I like this scripture here in John. He says, uh, the Jews said, we have a law. And by our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Amen. And uh, that's, that's all what you were talking about that's it. there. And that's what people and, don't uh, seem to realize, that why was he put to death? And there you have it. It's right there all over the place in the text. Right. And, and they tried to kill him like seven, six or seven different times before then. They tried to throw him off a cliff one time, but it, Jesus' time hadn't come, and so he walked through the crowd. <laughs> he just kind of went through, he got away. Uh, they were trying to kill him in different, at different times and places, but his time had not yet come as the scripture says. Uh -huh. But at, at the betrayal after the Last Supper, uh, you find that then, you know, what Jesus told Judas, what thou doest, do quickly. And that was his time to, and, to uh, go to the cross. And in, in Mark 15, uh, uh, 39, the centurion says, Truly, this man was the Son, son of, of God. God. One of his very crucifiers right. testified he was the Son of God. The Jews right. testified that he was the son of God. But you know this man here, this Gentile Roman centurion, mm -hmm. this is the first man to testify of the fact that Jesus Christ was the son of God following the crucifixion. And John refers to him back over here. He that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith truth, that you might believe. So, uh, this man that saw this on that occasion, he testified, this is the Son, Son of God. God. That truly, right. this man was the Son of That's God. That's right. And yet this doctrine is denied by all these different religions. Well, of course, Satan, and, that's the doctrine Satan hates most. Now, are you indicating uh, by that that now you have these actual religions with these prophets, so-called prophets of these different religions, stating point blank that Jesus is not the Son of God, Jesus is not God, and all these types of things, are you saying by that, when you say Satan, are you saying that these other religions are Satan-inspired when they make these denials of Jesus being the Son of God? Well, to say something is Satan-inspired is not uh, so significant. After all, uh, going back to the creation, the whole fall of man and what became of us after that was inspired of Satan. And, you know, Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. Well, that could be said of all of us because we all go back to that time in the Garden of Eden when Satan deceived Adam and threw the whole race into depravity. But it does say something when we say that uh, these false doctrines are the, the way that Satan hates the Son of God is to spawn these false doctrines. Men come up in their minds and they say, well... Oh, yeah, he was the son of God, but in this sense. And by the time they're through with it, of course, they've destroyed mm -hmm. the true teaching of the Bible on the son of God. Uh, you were talking a while ago about this thing of uh, someone teaching that Jesus was the uh, uh, illegitimate son of a, a fallen woman. Well, I remember years ago, there was a man that even spoke at one of the Baptist seminaries that put out the story that, He'd read somewhere where that Jesus was the illegitimate son of a German soldier. And he said, who could deny that that was the truth? Well, I can. Uh, for one, I can deny that, uh, that that's the truth. It's a falsehood. It's a lie of the devil. And so the devil puts these ideas in people's minds to redefine what son of God means. And if they can't get away with an outright denial of it, then they will redefine it. And it's in those areas of redefining that we have so much 
devilish and satanic work because uh, as the angel of light, the devil's chief work and chief ministry is deception. Mm -hmm. Deception, delusion, distortion. And the best way he can do this is to make men think that he is an angel of light, a servant of God. Mm -hmm. And so therefore many false prophets have gone out of the world. That's right. As false teachers. As we're war warned about over and over again in the New Testament as well as all over the place in the Old Testament. All right, going on to the uh, next point here, we have the work of Jesus Christ. Historic biblical Christianity says the work of Jesus Christ is outlined in the following. Jesus was born, lived, and died in a given time and place as a unique historical event. He lived a sinless life, died on the cross, arose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. He is the Messiah, the Christ, Lord, meaning he's God, and Savior, who forgives sin and will come again in glory and power. And you find your reference there for all of this in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, and many other references in the, in, in the New Testament. Well, uh, obviously, there's a lot of these other religions that would totally disagree with that. And for the sake of the viewers at home to get an understanding of this, we'll go through this real quick and then uh, have a little discussion about it. Okay, Judaism obviously doesn't agree with historic Christianity on the... Uh, the work of Jesus Christ. They say the opinion is somewhat divided. Jesus is seen as a reformer who, who performed good deeds. However, he also led people astray by claiming to be God. His death did not provide atonement for sin. And like I said before, if you go with the Jewish Talmud, you find that they say he was a false prophet. He's burning in hell. His, his followers are going to end up there uh, and all these other kind of dreadful things, but I'm not doing a show on that. Well, maybe we'll do a show on the Jewish Talmud someday. It's fascinating to see all the interesting teachings there, but they obviously just do not agree about anything the New Testament says about, after all, the Judaism is coming from the scribes and the Pharisees. It's, it's kind of, uh, these are the, the, the people who came from the scribes and the Pharisees, so naturally they would, would agree with the guys who crucified Jesus. Okay, now in Islam, Jesus was sent to the children of Israel and faithfully showed the signs of Allah, taught prayer, and brought the gospel in Jill. He did not die on a cross, but Allah took him into heaven. Most Muslims believe it wasn't Jesus that was crucified on a cross, but it was Judas instead. And there was no need for Jesus to die on a cross. His his uh, bloody death was not necessary in Islam. Okay, Hinduism says Jesus was a great religious teacher whose teachings can be valuable today in some regards. But uh, they really disagree with almost everything the New Testament says about what Jesus' work really was. Uh, Buddhism says Jesus was a great religious teacher whose teachings can be valuable today. In other words, some of maybe his, his humanitarian teachings found on the Sermon on the Mount and so forth, but they certainly don't buy into Jesus dying on a cross for forgiveness of sins, atoning for our sins, and raising the heaven, and uh, rising from the dead, and these types of things. Okay, Sikhism says that Jesus taught humans the golden rule. His death was not vicarious. Uh, the Baha'i world faith, they say he was a great prophet educator for his age, gave divine teachings, but with these other uh, great teachers coming along later, they uh, kind of superseded anything Jesus might have done. So Jesus wasn't all that important. He was no more important than any of the other people like Moses or Abraham or Muhammad. Okay, Native American religions say that Jesus currently, uh, an occasional reference to Jesus as a religious leader who lived a long time ago, but they really don't have much doctrine or, or belief about Jesus in any particular way. Secular humanism, according to secular humanists, the death of Jesus Christ has no impact on anyone living today. New Age movement says Christ is separate from Jesus, the way shower. Christ is the perfect God idea, the awareness of divinity within each person. In other words, the, the New Age people believe that Jesus was not the Christ, but 
he had the Christ principle and he was a way short, but he was definitely not anything the New Testament describes. Okay, uh, Roman Catholicism says that Jesus was born, lived, and died in a given time and place as a unique historical event. He lived a sinless life and willingly died on a cross as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. He arose from the dead and ascended into heaven. He is the Messiah, Christ, Lord, and Savior. He will one day come again in glory and power. John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. Also John chapter 3, verse 16. So that pretty much agrees with historic Christianity. Seventh-day Adventists say that Jesus lived a sinless life, died on the cross as atonement, and rose again, entered into a heavenly sanctuary in the year 1844 to initiate a, quote, investigative judgment, an investigative judgment, end quote, of those claiming to be Christians. So in other words, in 1844, Jesus came into this sanctuary where he's going to judge all your works. Uh, Ellen G. White said if you wear wigs, for instance, that can uh, cause brain damage, uh, so if you commit some of these types of sins or do other, you have to do certain works, you're going to be judged by this. Uh, and if you do certain things that you shouldn't have done, then you'll be judged badly in this 1844 sanctuary judgment and you won't make it to heaven. So anyway, that's Seventh-day Adventist. Jehovah's Witnesses say Christ's ransom sacrifice on the stake made salvation possible. Uh, so he didn't die on a cross, he died on a stake and he made it possible if you sell enough Watchtower and Awake magazines, or at least give them away, and do enough works for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, you might possibly make it into the new paradise on earth after the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, the Mormons say that Jesus' death guarantees immortality to all regardless of their faith. But one's exaltation must be completed by works suffered in Gethsemane for Adam's original sin. In other words, when he sweated great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's where he made up for Adam's original sin. But uh, uh, he didn't make up for sins such as murder. That's why you have to shed your own blood for your sins. That's why you have firing squads in Utah, according to the Mormon religion. There's some sins Christ's blood did not atone for, and uh, that you have to basically, you can have any faith and believe anything and be okay but uh, you won't become a god unless you believe it the Mormon way and have your own planet. Uh, okay, now in Church of Christ, scientists, Jesus is a way shower and a healer. So he shows us the way uh, in the Christ principle and all that stuff, but he certainly wasn't what the New Testament says he was. Unity School of Christianity, Jesus was a way shower whose crucifixion was not sacrificial, but released inspiration or grace as they call it, but they define it differently than a Christian would. And so they deny all the historic Christian doctrine of uh, Christ's atoning work, sacrifice, resurrection, and so forth. Uh, Church of Scientology of L. Ron Hubbard, the science fiction writer, he says, one Savior, he's saying that Jesus was one Savior among many who teaches people how to be clear of engrams. And an engram is impressions of past experiences. And once you get past these psychological problems, which are engrams, through the, the, the Church of Scientology, which will charge you $400 a session. And once you're clear of all these, these psychological problems, then you're clear to, to realize you were a, a, a god from 300,000 years ago, you'll be all right. So Jesus isn't that important in this situation. The Unification Church of Reverend Moon, the Korean, said that Jesus was a, to restore original relationship between God and humanity by marriage. His mission was incomplete because he was crucified before he could get married. Jesus is a spiritual but not physical savior. Because he, he failed in his mission to get married and have kids, he failed in the physical mission. And therefore, Reverend Moon has to come now as the second coming of Christ and lead people into uh, marriage to the Unification Church so physically they can be saved. But Jesus didn't accomplish any of this. Now, the way international of Victor Paul Weirwill he says that Jesus' ransom death was a legal transaction making salvation possible. Notice they're saying possible, but not salvation complete. Now, what we have here, brother, is uh, what it sounds like is something Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and following, about another gospel, another way of salvation, different good news, coming from a, a wide variety of different views 
on subjects. Brother, what we have here is what I call palaver. <laughs> Do you know what palaver means? Define it for the public, please. Well, palaver just means nonsense. And I picked that term up from the Three, three Stooges, by the way, Shemp. <laughs> <laughs> Shemp was referring to some of the things that were going on. He said, cut the palaver. Oh, okay. And uh, that's, a historical that's all, reference. all this here on here is palaver because uh -huh. when we come down to the rock bottom truth of the word of God, he that believeth on the Son is not condemned. Isn't that John 3.18? 3.18. And that's the only thing that's really important when it comes to the issue of these particular religions. We don't need them. We don't need the Reverend Moon. We don't need L. Ron Hubbard. We don't need Muhammad. We don't need Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, we don't need uh, Ellen G. Ellen White. Jean White. Uh, <laughs> we don't need these uh, Hindus, Buddhist Sikhs, Baha'u'llah, uh, the Bob, uh, whatever his name was. And we don't need the Pope. We don't need uh, Judge Rutherford Russell. He that believeth on the Son is not condemned. What, what can they add to that? Right. They can't add anything to it. They can't take away anything from it. And so for the normal Christian person, the important thing is to remember this. All the beautiful temples, cathedrals, and uh, whatnot that these religions can put on, all the embellishment they can give to their prophets, all the exaltation they can render their holy books or whatever, and all the fabulous garbs of ceremonies they can put on with their clothes and plums of embellishment, they're nothing of any consequence. He that believeth on the Son is not condemned. Amen. And they can't take away from it. They can't add anything to it. So I'd say to the normal Christian, just forget about these movements, forget about these doctrines, forget about these prophets. And if you meet one of them, just give him that scripture. You can be saved too. He that believeth on the Son is not condemned. Amen. If you'll believe on the Son, you won't have to have Reverend Moon. You won't have to have these others. You won't have to go down and be baptized by this, that one or the other one. You've got salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And that's basically what the, the Bible's telling us from beginning to end uh, throughout. So uh, uh, I could, with, with our time remaining, uh, go through a lot more doctrines, but I think our viewers at home are getting a good idea of what we're dealing with here in comparative religions. Uh, there, there's so much I could go into, but we're running out of time, and for the sake of more truth and less error. <laughs> uh, I think we've heard enough palaver uh, for one day as far as this show goes. Uh, but you know, you know, Larry, there is there is this thing where you can get lost in. And when I say lost, I mean you can get buried in the forest to chasing after the tail of these false prophets to expose them. Mm -hmm. You've you've got to you've got to keep the Christianity up first. And then just do these as you have to do them. And I think you've done a good job here in exposing across the board here and yet maintaining the Christian message up front. Uh, I mean, we're not just exposing these people for the sake of exposing this and that and the other. We are exposing this to put light on the gospel. Amen. That Jesus Christ is the way of salvation and that by faith in him, just by simple faith in him, not by any complicated faith, you can have everlasting life and you're not condemned. And all this hokey pokey and palaver of these false religions uh, have no consequence at all. That's right. In fact, uh, as a Christian, the best defense you have against false prophets, and remember Jesus warned about it, the apostles warned about it, approximately 33% of your New Testament documents including the epistles and everything, the gospels, are apologetic in nature. In other words, it's not apologizing for anything, but it's a defense against false prophets and their false doctrine, their false teaching. So you are given this word of God to help you as a Christian know what the truth is and protect your soul against those lies that are coming to you ever since the Garden of Eden. There in Genesis chapter 3, when the devil 
first said to Eve, yea, has God said? <laughs> and this is basically what you're getting with all these different religions is they're saying, yea, has God said, and then trying to turn you into a different gospel, another way of salvation. Yeah, what, what we need to concentrate on is when we deal with these aberrant religions is the uh, opposite of what they're teaching, the truth of it is the opposite. In other words, we magnify by using them as the mirror right. of the truth. When you look at the mirror, you're seeing something that's opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, when we present these teachings, we are presenting the opposite so that the Christian message comes out of the... Uh, we just use them as a stepping stone for presenting the positive truth of the Word of God. That is, that is very correct. And... Uh, one thing to uh, remember about all this, and you see it on the chart at home, says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, 1 John 1.10, that you should, as Bob has been saying and so forth, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, Acts 16.31 and John 1.12. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10. 9, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. If, if you've come to believe in Jesus as the Son of God and your risen Savior after uh, you know, hearing all this and learning the Word of God, then you will be saved, as it says in John 3, 18, you know, uh, as you've mentioned before. And I want to stress the point to our viewers. It says in the, in the epistles, it says, the study, the show thyself approved, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As you so appropriately pointed out earlier, a lot of these people that end up in these false religions that still somehow claim the Bible like those women did from that reference you gave out of Isaiah, uh, they're doing it, they, they have not studied the word of God. They're ignorant of the word of God. They don't know how to defend themselves from the word of God, but with the word of God. So you learn what this says. So it's like the counterfeiter with the money. Uh, how do you know uh, a bill, a, a piece of currency, is counterfeit unless you know what the real is? You know, when uh, people in banks are taught how to learn real currency from counterfeit money, they can tell from the texture, they can tell by looking at it, and it's because they're familiar with the original. Here's the Word of God. And then you've got these counterfeiters out here that are trying to uh, make merchandise of your soul. <laughs> through their counterfeit bills, uh, through the, the messengers of light, as, uh, as Brother Bob's brought out from Corinthians chapter 11 and so forth. Uh, so it's an understanding of God's Word. When dealing with cults and false religions, the thing that must be remembered is the Bible is inspired by God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. It's the Bible that deals with false prophets. So the Bible is the standard in which to measure the teachings of these false prophets. The Bible is made up of 66 different books written over a span of 1,600 years, approximately 1,500 B.C. to A.D. 100. It's written by more than 40 kings, prophets, leaders, and followers of Jesus. All these men were specifically chosen by God to relate his word to mankind. The New Testament consists of 27 books written approximately A.D. 45 to 100 A.D. The oldest New Testament fragment from John chapter 18 that we have today was copied in Greek on a papyrus codex, that's folded book, around A.D. 110 to 130 A.D. The Old Testament was written mainly in Hebrew with some Aramaic. We see here a sample of Aramaic letters. The letter Aleph in Hebrew script is demonstrated here. The New Testament was written in Greek we see here a sample of Greek letters. The letter Alpha in Koine Greek dialect is shown here. Matthew chapter 5 verse 18 in the King James Version 
says, quote, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled, end quote. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, in the Aramaic language, the jot is highlighted in red. As a viewer can see here, it's one of the slightest little elements in the Aramaic language, showing the importance of how God's word, down to the jot or tittle, is to be considered by God important. 1500 to 400 B.C. is the time of the Old Testament. When it was written, events are written down in Hebrew with portions in Aramaic over many centuries. In Exodus, the Lord tells Moses to write in a book. Other writers, inspired by God, include leaders, kings, and prophets. Together, these writings on leather scrolls and other materials are called the Hebrew Scriptures or Old Testament. Ezra written approximately 450 B.C. According to Jewish tradition, Ezra, a priest and scribe, collects and arranges some of the books of the Hebrew Bible around 450 B.C. The Septuagint, 250 to 100 B.C. The Septuagint is the first Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. It was translated in 250 to 100 B.C. by Jewish scholars in Alexandria, Egypt. The word Septuagint means 70. This refers to the tradition that 70 or 72 men translated it. Septuagint is often abbreviated LXX, the Roman numeral for 70. The 53 books of this translation, the Septuagint, are arranged by subject. Torah, that's mainly the works of Moses, history, poetry, and prophecy. 200 B.C., papyrus, scrolls of leather, and later of papyrus, are used to make copies of the scriptures. A papyrus codex is a bound volume made from sheets folded and sewn together, sometimes with a cover. They are used more than scrolls after A.D. 1 to A.D. 100. The papyrus plant is cut into strips and pressed into sheets of writing material and can be made into a scroll or a codex. The New Testament books were probably first written on papyrus scrolls. A.D. 45 to 100 A.D., followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus write eyewitness reports, the Gospels, history, letters to other believers, and the Revelation. This would include Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Peter, and Jude. The writers quote from all but eight of the Old Testament books. One example, Psalm 118, verses 22 through 23, is quoted in Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. The New Testament, A.D. 100. The original writings are copied and circulated so that by approximately A.D. 150, there is wide enough use of them to speak of the New Testament, also known as the New Covenant. The New Testament, also known as the New Covenant, is promised in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 32, referred to by Jesus in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, referred to by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, and referred to in the book of Hebrews. A.D. 200 to 300, Early translations, earliest translations, Latin, Coptic, found in Egypt, and Syriac, found in Syria. And you have an example here of an early Coptic translation. A.D. 200 to 300, Church Fathers. Church Fathers accept the writings of the Gospels and Paul's letters 
as canonical. Canonical means from a Greek word referring to the rule of faith and truth. AD 200 to 300, the canon. The canon refers to the authoritative books that are officially accepted and approved as Holy Scripture. These books are based on a standard or rule of faith. Some of these standards include divine inspiration, accuracy, doctrinal truth, consistency, power, and acceptance by the people of God. AD 313, the canon. The New Testament books are collected and circulated throughout the Mediterranean about the time of Constantine, the Roman emperor, who legalizes Christianity in A.D. 313. A.D. 397, the canon. The 27 books of the New Testament are formally confirmed as canonical by the Synod of Carthage in A.D. 397, thus recognizing three centuries of use by followers of Christ. Evidence for the Bible. One, it's confirmed by secular historians. Two, manuscript reliability. Three, archaeological evidence. And four, 2,000 fulfilled prophecies. Secular historians like the Jewish Josephus before AD 100, the Roman Tacitus around AD 120, the Roman Suetonius AD 100, and the Roman governor Pliny Secundus AD 100 affirm one or more historical New Testament references. Over and over again, comprehensive field work in archaeology and careful biblical interpretation affirms the reliability of the Bible. It is telling when a secular scholar must revise his biblical criticism in light of solid archaeological evidence. Over 456 prophecies and their inferences of the coming of the Messiah are mentioned in Old Testament references. Biblical Christianity tells the truth about who is Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is God, the second person of the Trinity, Matthew 28, 19. As God the Son, He has always existed and was never created. The Bible says Jesus is fully God and fully man. The two natures joined, not mixed. As the second person of the Trinity, he is co-equal with God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter 2 says that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In becoming man, Jesus was begotten through the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. The Bible clearly states that Jesus is the only way to the Father, salvation, and eternal life. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. The Bible says Jesus will come again visibly and physically at the end of the world to establish God's kingdom and judge the world. See Revelation chapter 19 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers with Bob L. Ross, Director of Pilgrim Publications. Thank you, Bob. It's always great to have you here. Uh, join us again next time when we uh, bring up uh, another subject that hopefully will be edifying to you. But remember, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You didn't have to read the Book of Mormon. You don't have to get a Quran and read that. You don't have to get L. Ron Hubbard's science fiction books through Scientology or any of that stuff. You don't need a Korean man to tell you who to get married to. You just need Jesus Christ. Believe on him and you will not be condemned. Thank you so much for being with us. God bless you all.
check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.